guess you know okay <laughs> i i'm not uh, i'm not experienced at uh, being a zoom presenter i was kind of wondering if there's an easy way to get some indication from people about how many of our attendees have actually um, used the star tools at all um, so joe maybe you've already done this so if you actually hit participants and click on that, you yeah. will see like there's panelists and attendees and the attendees can raise their hands and so on. They should be able to. Um, right. You know, so. Okay. So yeah, um, just, just to get a, a sense, you know, if, if you've actually already, if you already have some experience with using the tools, can you, can you maybe uh, hit the raise your hand button um, just to try and get some idea of the, and it looks like we have a fair number of people who have and a fair number of people who either haven't or are shy, which is fine. Thanks. Um, okay, I'm gonna get started uh, by opening up this slideshow and sharing my screen. Okay, um, so uh, as, as uh, Priya hinted in, in her introduction, um, there's actually going to be, this is going to be kind of divided into, into two parts. And in the first part, we're going to talk about the, the STAR tools, the, the web applications, um, and in the, and that'll that'll be primarily me with backed up by by Susan, um, who's been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, and uh, and then in the second part, um, Yelena, backed up by Eileen, um, will be talking about the uh, the Research Informatics Center and um, the ways that they can help you with tasks that. Um, go beyond what you can accomplish with just the star tools, put it that way. All right, um, and let's try and make this um, interactive. Um, so uh, I guess Priya, you're monitoring the chat. If there are questions, you can type in um, and, uh, and you're muted. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I was actually going to just say if somebody else could monitor the chat, there are some people who are having trouble getting on. So I'm just trying to reply to them and make sure that they are getting on. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll monitor chat for you, Joe. No worries. Okay. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, let me apologize if you, if you happen to be looking at my face, you'll see that I'm not looking at the camera because I have. Uh, a camera here and a monitor here. So sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yes, the, the first part of, of this um, is going to be uh, led by me and Susan, uh, a little bit of background on us. Um, we're, uh, we're both computer science PhDs. I'm actually a Stanford alum. And uh, I've been here in, uh, I was about to say research IT, but now research IT has been renamed. So I've been here at uh, Research Technology Engineering for the School of Medicine and TDS. Um, uh, so I need to fix that slide um, for five years. Uh, and I also um, work with the uh, SEAL, which is the Stanford Emerging Applications Lab. Um, where Susan is uh, the uh, director of engineering, and Susan uh, is uh, a uh, a long time uh, um, member of the, the School of Medicine uh, research uh, technology team. Uh, she's been at Stanford for uh, twenty years. Uh, we're um, 
going to be very sorry that she's planning to retire in a year. Um, but uh, she knows she knows um, she knows a lot more than I do, <laughs> and so I'm relying on her to fill in the gaps. Um, and let's uh, move on. Okay, so um, what we're talking about today are star tools. Um, which are basically two web applications um, that uh, work together. Uh, and their primary function is to um, let you explore the, uh, the data that, uh, that we have from the, the two hospital systems, the, the adult and, and children's hospital for research purposes. Um, primarily, um, because <clears throat> they can also be used for some other purposes, but those are the primary purposes. Um, and uh, in order to in order to use the tools, you have to have a, a valid, fully sponsored SUNET ID. Um, the cohort discovery tool is designed to let you go through electronic medical records data. Um, and figure out uh, um, who are the patients that meet certain criteria. Uh, usually these criteria are defined by your research question. Um, and I'm gonna you know, confess here, I'm, I'm a software engineer. I don't actually do medical research. Um, and so um, my understanding of what those questions look like is probably a little bit fuzzy. Um, I'm sorry, Joe, I don't want to interrupt, but just while we're still getting set up. So I know it looks mm -hmm. like the chat is disabled. Um, you, I think everybody can still ask a question in the Q&A. You, you cannot chat, but if that's okay with everybody, we'll keep it as it is. The, my other option, because the webinar has already started, I can go in and change the settings of the webinar. Um, but what I can do is we can make everybody like everybody effectively just gets promoted to panelists. So that way you can jump in and talk if if that's what you guys prefer. So let me know what you would like. Yes, I think that would be wonderful because we do want this to be interactive. We okay. want people to be able to just break in with their questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. A lot of people are declining to be made panelists. It, that's the, fine, that's out to them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, um, so cohort discovery lets you uh, define sets of patients and then chart review lets you review charts um, and export data for analysis. Um, so this is this is a high level view of um, the clinical data that we have uh, that that. Uh, is available to um, to researchers. Um, the main things are that uh, we have the two uh, electronic medical record systems, which are um, both um, EPIC, the, the adult hospital system and the, uh, the children's hospital system. Um, there's a mention here of Cerner uh, because they're used to, before they switched over to EPIC, they were using Cerner and we have had some data from there directly, although um, I think it's all been imported into Epic. Um, there are um, shared resources, um, radiology and the clinical labs are common um, to both the, the adult and the children's system. Um, and then there are a bunch of um, uh, additional uh, information sources um, that uh, are, uh, some of them are shared and some of them are not, um, but they range from uh, things like cardiology and uh, echoes and uh, uh, ECGs and uh, bedside monitoring, which is a relatively recent thing that came online over the last couple of years um, that uh, was um, 
pioneered at the uh, at Children's Hospital and is now uh, we're getting adult data available as well. Um, so uh, that's that's a description of what the you know what the clinical data is that exists in our world. Um, when we come to research, there are, there are uh, um, two things that are going on. One is that we are uh, combining and uh, uh, the data from the different systems, um, selecting but only selecting some of them uh, to store in our database, and and we are also uh, obeying certain restrictions that are imposed by the uh, the privacy and uh, research um, compliance uh, offices. So uh, not everything that's in the clinical system is available in STAR, which um, is our research data repository. Um, but, but we uh, do make uh, every effort to make sure that uh, all of the clinical information that is relevant to research gets pulled in as much as we possibly can, given the compliance constraints that we are operating on. Yes. Most of the stuff we filter out is stuff that researchers are not interested in. That's a good point. Um, so uh, I guess I can just see if there are any questions before I move on to the next slide. Uh, I guess. Um, Mostly just questions about how to get access to the recording afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> OK. All right. So as I mentioned, um, uh, STAR is our, our research data repository. That's what the two R's stand for. Um, and uh, it's it's actually a an, an ecosystem of data um, that covers a whole lot of a, a lot of things. Um, we have um, our own homegrown uh, data model, which we call the Star Tools data model, and that's used by the Star Tools applications, the cohort discovery and chart review tools that we're primarily talk primarily talking about in this section. Um, and custom data sets. And then in addition to that, we have um, the, uh, the OMOP data model and the Atlas tool, um, which will be the subject of another workshop in two weeks. I'm not sure exactly when the next uh, workshop is. Um, but if you're interested in those, um, there will be a, um, a workshop devoted to those. Uh, we have image data. Um, we have real-time data that can be used for research alerting. Um, that's a, uh, a wonderful system uh, that can be used by researchers who need to be made aware in real time of uh, patients they presenting in the emergency department with particular uh, conditions. Um, other clinical data, other um, such as uh, the vital signs waveforms I uh, mentioned just before, and um, there are there are a lot of others out there, um, and we've been added as we've added a lot of them to Star. Uh, but if there's something that you know about that um, that you'd like to see, uh, you should let us know. Um, and <clears throat> this wonderful chart shows how much our data has grown over time. Um, and part of this is just, you know, more patients, more data about the patients. Uh, but it's also reflecting the fact that we are getting more sources of information. Um, so there's a lot of data in the system. And that means that if you're doing research, you have to deal with the question of, um, do I want, what data do I want? Um, can I, uh, how can I manage the data that I'm going to be getting? Um, uh, 
so back into what's uh, specifically in the star tools data model um, we have uh, billing codes for diagnoses and procedures we have um, encounter and admit discharge and transfer records we have test results uh, both quantitative and qualitative so that will include uh, labs um, and also pathology um, We have free text uh, reports and notes. Um, we have drug orders. We have drug administration records. Um, and there are all kinds of caveats around those. Um, drug administration records, of course, are, uh, are only present if the drug was administered um, by uh, one of our clinicians. Um, Drug orders have um, a problem that uh, patients get uh, prescriptions from outside providers and our information about that is incomplete. Um, we have procedure orders um, and we have uh, flow sheets, which for, um, uh, for inpatients in particular can be a, a valuable source of information, but also a voluminous source of information. Um, in terms of the, you know, the quantity of data, um, flow sheets, and the uh, reports and notes that have a lot of text in them, those are the ones that tend to be the, the big ones. The the data model um, does not include images directly. It'll it'll have um, orders for imaging, um, and it'll have reports and notes with uh, you know radiologist impressions and and such. Um, but the images themselves, if you need them for research, um, there's a, a separate path to getting those that does not go through um, the uh, the self-service tools. And likewise, some of this ancillary data, for instance, the waveform data that I mentioned, uh, that's not available through these tools, but it is available. So if you need it, uh, you should be able to get it. Um, and now, now comes the black box warning. Um, which is um, using clinical data for research is maybe a, know, maybe a bad idea. It's a little bit strong, um, but is there there are um, there are uh, risks involved um, in using clinical data for research. So um, this is observational in particular. So um, we're we're not going to be able to use this data in order to conduct the gold standard of a randomized trial. We're only able to look at history. Um, our evidence uh, can be incomplete and um, our ability to draw inferences is limited. So, um, These are, you know, some examples of good questions um, that um, the data may not be able to answer. Um, and uh, the medical the medical record system is designed to, to document uh, document uh, clinical information and to support billing, um, and it's not designed to support research. Um, this is um, this is an excellent example that, uh, that Susan came up with. Um, that uh, you may not be able to tell what the reason was that something was done based on a billing code, um, and um, clinicians are focused on treating their patients, and they're not thinking about 
am I supplying am I recording and supplying information that will be useful for a researcher? So you really do need to think about these considerations from the very beginning of your uh, of your research process in order to figure out whether you are going to be um, able to use the tools that are available and reach conclusions that uh, that are justified. Some uh, additional considerations. Um, there is a lot of complexity in the uh, the EPIC uh, medical record system, uh, tens of thousands of tables, um, and drawing drawing it all together into a coherent picture is not easy. We do the best we can, um, but uh, it's not perfect. Um, the data is incomplete and can be misleading, um, especially with respect to outcomes. One of the problems with um, doing research at Stanford is uh, people come to Stanford for um, frequently, people come to Stanford because they have a serious medical issue that can't be handled by their primary care physician who might not be a Stanford um, clinician. Uh, so that means we may have incomplete information about their medical history, and um, we're uh, not necessarily going to have information about what happens to them after they've been treated at Stanford. Um, we have um, death data that is incomplete. Um, if a patient uh, sadly dies while they're in our care, um, the medical record system will reflect that. If they die after they've um, been seen by one of our clinicians, we might hear about it, and we might not. Um, we have uh, data from the Social Security Administration that tells us about um, some of our patients, but the data itself is incomplete, and we can only use it if we can successfully match patient identities. Um, and more and more, we don't even know um, uh, the uh, social security number of our patient. Um, and uh, if, uh, if we don't have an accurate birth date, um, which happens surprisingly often, um, it's hard to match, um, match that data up. Um, Privacy and compliance are paramount, and that does have some impact on what we can make available. Um, anytime you're doing research that uh, that includes uh, protected health information, um, you need to be aware of uh, of exactly what your um, what the risks are. And I love this, I'd forgotten this. Um, it helps to keep your expectations low. Um, that's a very good, uh, good phrasing there. Um, so uh, with all that, so um, these tools are, um, are able to, to help you do research and we're not going to try and, uh, um, tell you otherwise, because that's why they exist. Before we um, dive into demos, uh, we had a question in the Q&A asking for a um, quick overview of real-time research alerting. Could you just off the cuff something about real-time uh, research? Sure. sure. Um, so uh, this system, which is which is called uh, CEP, CEP for Complex Event Processing, um, is a um, is a way that uh, researchers can define a set of rules that um, can be applied to uh, events that are happening uh, as they happen or as soon as possible after they happen. Um, a, a typical 
example, I, which I, I alluded to, is um, you uh, might have um, a rule that says if someone presents to the emergency department and they're given a, a diagnosis code that says that they were uh, bitten by a dog, um, then uh, you want to um, be notified about that. Uh, and uh, the system will monitor the, the real-time events, um, which are uh, uh, HL7 messages um, that describe what's going on uh, as patients are being uh, processed and allows uh, setting up an alert that might be a, a pager, an email. Um, I think those are the two main uh, alerts. Um, and uh, I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah, it's, um, it's worth noting that it is complicated to set it up, much more complicated than um, doing chart review or searching for similar patients. So we have no self-service option for, for real-time research alerts. So you have, do have to engage with right. us, describe your problem, and then we have to, there's back and forth, uh, and there's a a test period where we, you know, we guess and check. So we start sending you alerts and then you have to tell us, you know, wait, no, you missed an alert. Um, but yeah, we can with sufficient patience and persistence set up a way of triggering notifications uh, uh, in real time when certain things happen in the hospital that uh, you need to know for your research protocol. So yeah, with that, why don't we get uh, back into the self-service aspect? And if the person who had the question about, um, Real-time research alerting has more questions. They can raise them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> is there a fee? <laughs> yes. Yeah, there is a fee. Uh, it costs um, between four and six thousand dollars to set it up. Uh, and then I think there's a nominal monthly fee to run it, but I don't remember anymore, but it's it's less than a thousand a month. It's like 500 a month. Um, but yes, you, you do need to uh, help uh, oper cover the costs of, oper of operations because it is a custom solution. Yeah. All right. Um... So yeah, while, while Joe is navigating to this, we're now going to uh, enter the workshop section. So everyone, I hope you all brought your laptops. You're obviously all on your laptops. Minimize your <laughs> Zoom window, shove it off to the side, open up a web browser, and navigate <laughs> to um, Star Tools. Uh, are you going to show them how to get there from this, from star.stanford.edu? That's a good idea. I, just, yeah, I, I don't even there. know that I know how to do that. I was uh, going to start to the Star uh, Tools website. Well, well, you could start here at star.stanford.edu, okay. um, and then you can uh, click on self service. Um, and this describes uh, a bunch of things, some of which, most of which we uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and then uh, you can click on learn more about STAR tools, and that will take you to this page, um, which I already had open in another browser. Um, it's worth noting that this particular site, the STAR tools website, is just absolutely packed with information. It is well worth mm -hmm. taking the trouble to click on each of those menus on the left and just get familiar with, with what's there. There is so much valuable self-service information on this site about how to use the self-service tools. It's a very handy reference. Yeah. Um, but this, uh, so this describes the, uh, the three steps involved in using the tools. Um, step one is cohort discovery. Um, and step two uh, is uh, dealing with your uh, Oops, Shoot. excuse me. Uh, your compliance requirements, um, and then step three is doing chart review or 
and or data download. So we're going to start um, with cohort discovery. Um, this is what you'll see when you launch the, uh, the star tools. Um, it starts out with um, a, a notice about uh, the purpose of the system, which is that it is for research. Uh, it's not designed or intended to support patient care. Um, that uh, you can't uh, distribute information outside of uh, Stanford. Um, obviously, un unless you have gone through the appropriate uh, procedures. Um, uh, we do logging and, and auditing. Um, and um, you are, uh, as all, as with every IT system at Stanford, you're expected not to share your uh, credentials with anyone else. Um, and, uh, well, thanks for the reminder. That's actually worth uh, a, a sort of calling out in a big warning. Please, when you're working with uh, clinical information for research, you need to be super careful of it. You are a custodian of some extraordinarily valuable and sensitive information. So take, take privacy concerns very, very seriously. Whenever possible, please try to work with a de-identified. Please bear in mind that our de-identification is imperfect and that you will be exposed to PHI. Don't ever, ever, ever post any of it on an external website of any kind unless you've got made sure that your PI has all of the correct contracts and legal agreements in place. It's literally against the law to post clinical data outside of your organization. So please, please do treat it cautiously and carefully. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um... So this is what you're presented with uh, at the beginning of using cohort discovery tool. Um, the very first thing I wanna call your attention to is the question mark in the upper right corner, which is the help button. Um, there is a link there to take you to the documentation and the, the overall, let's see, I forget now exactly which, which page each of these goes to. Um, but there's uh, a user's guide for cohort discovery, a user's guide for chart review. Um, we have a link for uh, connecting with the RIC. Um, we have uh, a little bit of information about the data that is available at this moment in the system. So actually, I'm going to bring that up and it's going to tell us. Um, yes. It's going to tell us that we're looking at data as of uh, yesterday um, from both uh, the adult and uh, children's hospital systems. Uh, and this last one um, is really important, um, reporting a bug or making a suggestion. Um, if you click on that, you get a chance to fill out a message. Um, if there's a bug or a question that relates to what you're seeing on the screen, you can include a screenshot in it and uh, send us feedback and we will respond. So um, with that said, uh, we start with uh, we start with searches um, because that's the main thing that the co-op discovery tool is for, and uh, we're um, we're going to uh, explore. Uh, hopefully, we can get uh, maybe a suggestion from someone <laughs> someone in the audience about uh, an example of what they might be interested in looking at. Um, there are some suggestions here. Uh, um, and uh, there, are, there are some interesting things that are buried in these uh, simple questions as well. For instance, if we're asking how many diabetic patients are currently taking metformin, um, we can uh, look at patients who have a diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, 
Um, and we'll see that uh, because we're using uh, ICD-10 um, numeric codes, there are a lot of matches. Um, some of them are very specific, you know, relating to uh, specific uh, um, conditions like uh, retinopathy. Some of them are very broad. Um, like up here, we've got basically the entire uh, class of just about anything that is classified as diabetes. Um, and um, the other part of that question was uh, ones that are uh, patients that are currently taking metformin. Um, the, uh, the way the uh, cohort discovery tool works is that each of the top level conditions that we're specifying here, each of these big boxes, um, is a condition that is a constraint that is going to be added to our um, our uh, filtering of the, the set of patients. So if I have a diagnosis and I have a drug, um, what's going to happen is um, the set of patients that I'm going to find are ones that match, that have both of these conditions. I have some questions to guide this when you're Okay, so the, the, we have one question. For the question yeah. of metformin, can you stratify those with metformin drug order for one year or more, for example? Max? Don't think we can- Interesting question. Yeah, I think what we can, you click on the analyze button real um, quick. So that'll show some graphs, but it's not a stratification. I think stratification is something yeah. that need to do yourself in R after you've gotten the data. Um, so this is the this is the only built-in analytics that we currently have. You get to see uh, very simple static yeah. graphs of um, top 10 lists and uh, demographic breakdowns for your current um, patient population. Um, neat. Yeah, that's it. Um, and the other, oh, uh, so somebody's asking about temporal constraints. So we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. And then um, you were talking about and and or, are there additional Boolean operations, for example, or, uh, yes, there is or. Would you, uh, Joe, you want to explain how or works? Right. Right. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I might be interested in uh, patients who are taking uh, metformin or they're taking, oh boy, I won't know anything. <laughs> I don't know anything about drugs for diabetes. Um, oh, okay. Uh, patients who are taking metformin or they're taking insulin. Oh dear, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of choices here and I don't know, um, exactly what I would choose uh, because I am not uh, um, I'm not qualified um, and just just pick the top one I guess yeah um, so in this case I'd you know be able to find uh, uh, either of these drugs and uh, I guess what I should have done I should have done a count um, So the, the basic idea is that if you want to make the search, the uh, numbers go smaller, you drag new uh, versions of the constraints in from the left-hand side. Each new thing that you pull in from the left-hand side is going to yep. uh, make things smaller. And if you want to expand the search, you have to use that plus box on the left uh, within the search. So there's no way for us to if it's going to be a super complicated search involving Boolean logic with parentheses, we're going to talk about that in the second half of this, of this workshop because the <laughs> Research Informatics Center is there to craft your custom queries yeah. all day long. 
this is this first half is just about the self-service tools, but we can also offer much more than just self-service. Um, so yeah, why don't you uh, add a temporal constraint here and and talk a little bit about yes, pairs of events? That's exactly what I was going to do. Um, so uh, okay, let's say um, that we're interested in uh, a relationship between these two. We want to say um, that. Uh, and uh, perhaps we want to know um, who has been, uh, who was uh, started on, okay, let's, let's take this, let's take the metformin out and say who was started on insulin um, uh, more than, uh, one year after their first diagnosis of uh, diabetes. Um, so that's that's the uh, that's the constraint that I've I've just crafted here. I've said the, the earliest incidence of the the diagnosis precedes the earliest instance of the the drug by more than one year. Um, now, since I've probably picked the wrong drug, there's a good chance that I'm going to find out that I don't have anybody in the system that meets these criteria. Um, um, so Sun Kim recommends insulin glargine if you are having trouble finding patients. Okay. And it takes, it does take a while to do the um, temporal query counts. Oh, 760. That's yeah, not bad. But Okay, I got some. Yep. Um, so, but yes, presumably if I if I specified the uh, the recommended uh, uh, yes. So while you're uh, the top ten, you go back to the idea of the analyze button. That those top ten lists were indeed the top ten of whatever for the patients in the current cohort query. So in our case, we're looking yes. at people uh, with a diagnosis of diabetes who are uh, on insulin. Uh, if we were to hit the analyze button, it would show the top 10 for those patients. And then if you change the query uh, and put in different constraints, you can hit the top 10 button again, the analyze button again, and it'll show you top 10 for the new cohort. So it's a nice way of, of playing with the data. Um, and uh, the uh, yeah the the temporal the temporal constraints are are uh, are computationally expensive compared to the other queries, so that tends to take a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, uh, do this analysis. Uh, which is going to take a while again. Um, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> um, but uh, to say a little bit more about the temporal constraints. So, so I said, uh, you know, this is an example where we said uh, uh, a patient was diagnosed um, at least a year. Um, before they were prescribed insulin, we could also say um, uh, something like uh, they uh, started on insulin uh, less than six months after that first diagnosis. So the, the way the question was phrased is uh, Taylor Hughes asked, can you explain the limitations of the temporal constraints filter? It was an interesting phraseology. So the, the limitations are in the data. We have truly tried our, our absolute very best to offer some way of making sense of this unbelievably chaotic, messy clinical data that is there in STAR. One of the possible limitations, if you are very familiar with your own data, is that we, our self-service tool, may be looking at the wrong date uh, of a whole whole array of dates associated with the clinical data in question. 
Um, another may be that if that the phrasing that we use is unintuitive, perhaps to people who aren't familiar with thinking about how to wrangle two otherwise unrelated temporal data streams. Um, but if you have any questions about uh, any observations about limitations, uh, we'd love to hear them and maybe yeah. we can improve what we've done. So um, Taylor, I'd love to hear more. And and I'll also, you know, um, throw out a, a plug here for another one of the workshops. If you have very complicated temporal constraints that you are interested in, the ACE tool is the tool that is built for solving your problem in particular. Um, and there will be a, a workshop that talks about the ACE tool, um, but uh, complex temporal relationships um, are, are the starting point for that tool. Um, so the ACE workshop is actually next Wednesday, April 26th, between three and five. Um, Okay, uh, so I didn't uh, didn't mention we have, um, I should have gone, <laughs> should have said something about the other categories here. So we have a, a demographics category, um, if you are interested in particular uh, in patients who are currently a certain age, um, perhaps you're only interested in people who are um, 35 or younger. Um, uh, we can add demographics constraints. Um, um, I'll, I'll just mention here, um, our user interface uses the word gender um, and we're, uh, we're using data that is, is not gender. Um, we I'm don't sure. actually have all of the all of the different information available um, in our in our uh, in our system at the moment about um, sex and uh, so, but this is this is sex. There, this is biological sex and, and not gender. I think is the point you're trying to make. This is not yes. gender identity. This is their sex at birth. Well, yeah, actually, it's it's not that. It's not that I wanted to raise it. It's 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 something that the system calls administrative sex. Okay. Um, and it is with that is almost always sex assigned at birth, um, but um, for uh, for trans patients, I think. Um, it represents their legal sex and uh, not their sex assigned at birth. Um, anyway, kind of digression. Um, so other other uh, event types. I mean, we we talked about diagnoses and uh, um, and drugs. We have procedures. Uh, again, procedures are used the uh, the standard procedure codes. Um, uh, usually CPT four. Um, uh, let's say uh, here. Um, so you can have an appendectomy, um, and each each of these each of uh, these clinical events have the same set of constraints that can be applied to them in terms of the age of the patient at the time the event occurred. Um, the event date. Uh, so if you were looking for people who uh, tested positive uh, for COVID um, before 2020, um, you should not find any. Um, and whether there's um, uh, a specific number of occurrences um, of the particular event. Um, so, um, Joe, time check. We're at one hour. Yeah. Um, yep. The research we should, could you spend five minutes doing an absolutely blazingly fast overview of, of cohort of chart review? And then we will turn it yes. over to the Research Informatics Center. 
Yes, thank you. Um, so that's that's our quick overview of cohort discovery. Um, and uh, the key thing, if you're going to do chart review after you've identified a cohort is you're going to click on the, uh, the save for review button and that's going to bring up uh, this dialog box um, that lets you name your cohort, supply the compliance information, um, specify uh, whether your um, whether your chart review or data downloads is going to include PHI, which um, is going to depend on uh, your data privacy attestation uh, and. Um, you can name other people who can work on uh, on your saved cohort. I'm not going to do this right now because I have previously saved one. Um, and because this is being uh, recorded and distributed, um, I've uh, created a cohort that um, has uh, minimal PHI. So, uh, you don't see you don't see patient names. You don't see exact dates of birth. Um, and this is this is the view that you get in chart review. Um, the some of the key things to point out here um, are the notes section. Uh, if you look at uh, a patient and you want um, to make some notes that are relevant to your research question. Uh, you can fill them in there. Um, and when uh, you go back to the chart view, you'll be able to see the notes. The status is um, frequently uh, people will um, create a, a list of candidates and then the primary purpose of chart review will, for them will be that they go through and look at the individual um, individual candidates and decide whether or not they should be included or excluded uh, in, uh, in the eventual set that they're going to be um, looking at. Uh, you can also create your own custom tags. Um, and you uh, will be able to search by that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's things fall out here. Um, you can also download data. Right. Um, that's half the important part here. Um, so this this part over here is already filled in because I created a download. Um, if it were not, um, you would see um, in the first part of this, which is uh, you can specify the range of, of dates that you're interested in, if you're only interested in a subset, um, whether or not to include only the patients who have been marked as included in your review and the specific data types that you are interested in. Um, so there's a wonderful um, a detailed guide. Would you flip over to the Star Tools uh, um, data site and go to the um, self-service chart review, chart review user's guide, um, and then scroll down oh, in under overview, scroll up a little bit. Do you see that link, the chart review tool user's guide? That is a supplemental user's guide. Click through it. It, it looks kind of plain. Uh, it's just a Google doc, but it can, tells you how to do all kinds of fancy tricks, uh, including custom uh, logic, like you can use and, or, near, blah, blah, blah. If you scroll down to the bottom, it'll you get to the section where it talks about all of the fancy advanced uh, search yeah, advanced and special search, characters. Yeah. So that's, that's a real power user tool. Um, it can be very helpful when searching through charts to craft this complicated query. And then all of a sudden, all of the patients who match that specific focused search are the ones who are showing up in your list. 
And with that, I think we should uh, hand the microphone over to uh, Yelena. Um, we can always have, there'll probably yes. be questions uh, at the end. We can always get back to any other unanswered things about the self-service tools uh, at the end. of Right. The oh, uh, actually, let me just answer this one quick question. Uh, someone asked about the asterisk on Ooh, good uh, question. 15. And that is a good question. And this is the answer right here um, in the patient info summary. The asterisk means that one or more of the encounters in the medical system were removed for compliance reasons. We have, we have complex rules about what we can uh, look at for research. And uh, in this case, this patient uh, had an encounter that we could not include for research. And so we make that information available. So at, at least, you know, when we can, we try to make sure that you know what you don't know. Um, because all too often, we simply don't know what we don't know because there's no information available at all. In this case, we know that that information is might be relevant and is not available. And so you can take that into consideration. All right. Um, and uh, now we will turn things over to uh, Elena. I will stop sharing. All right. Um... Hi, everybody. Let me just share my presentation. Okay. So we are Research Informatics Center. Um, Elena, you're not sharing yet. Oh, sorry. Green share isn't showing up on our Zoom. Got you, got you. Let me try it again. Is this good? Yes. Perfect. Okay. yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we work very closely with Joe's and Susan's uh, groups. Um, and uh, so um, I'm going to talk about our role, what we can help you with, um, then the workflow, how we would, how to contact us and what happens next. Um, have a very quick assemble project and then Q&A. Okay. So we have access to all EPIC data, a uh, complete set of EPIC data. So um, what we can help you with is, is if you have a very complex search, as you just saw in the star tools, uh, there are some limitations to the ORs and ANDs that you can do. Sometimes, uh, very often, people have very complex search criteria. Um, or if you're looking for some variables which are you know, somewhere hidden deep within the clarity tables, um, we can help you find those. So in 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 that uh, in those cases, we can um, help you. We can write the custom queries and extract the data for you. Um, another thing we can do is we have kind of broad view of available clinical data sources. So if you don't know where to go, you're looking for a specific you know type of data. We can help you uh, connect you to the right team. We may not be the team extracting the data, but we'll be a part of the team. We'll check your compliance and we'll connect you to the right person. Um, what we can also do is if you're, so we all, always recommend to try the star tools first. They're free, they're awesome, they're great. They can solve a lot of, uh, answer a lot of your questions. Um, and you can get an idea about your research if there are enough patients. For your research if you have questions about using star tools you can also talk to us and we'll help you figure things out okay so this is kind of a workflow so you have your research question we recommend again you go to star tools page read the documentation try it out meanwhile you can uh, talk to us we'll help you figure things out then you would obtain compliance, which generally include your IRB and the privacy attestation. Um, and then either you download data yourself using the, the self-service star tools, or we can do a data pool for you. And then, of course, you analyze, write the paper and publish. So we do have a website where, which provides all the useful links. Um, and uh, this is how to contact us. So if you 
like sometimes you don't need to contact us at all. So if you know how to, uh, you know, follow compliance, you can read the documentation. Um, you use the star service, the self service star tools, you download the data, you do not need to talk to us. But if you have additional questions, or if uh, you have a more complex search criteria, you would go to our web page and there are links here, first link to the star tools, uh, then um, this is a, how you submit a request. So you would fill out our intake form and uh, you would get an email back with the case number and then you would schedule an office hour. That's pretty much the workflow of how to connect with us. Um, let's see. Oops. There's one more little, uh, well, not little, there's one more thing to note here that uh, sometimes in uh, some cases, you can actually use EPIC to extract some data. Uh, normally, the Stanford policy is that you are supposed to use star tools. Uh, they're all the different filtering applies, so you can see patients that you're only supposed to see. But sometimes, in some cases, you have a small amount of patients, small number of patients, and uh, you're looking for some variable which is not available in star. Then uh, you would fill out this special form that is called research use uh, exceeds star capabilities. There's a link for that form right here um, on our intake form. And what happens is uh, you would automatically, you would kind of, you know, sign the form and say, yes, I, you know, cannot use uh, star tools for this data. I need to use Epic. And then uh, you submit the form and it, it is automatically emailed to you. You do not need our approval for this. You do not need to wait for anything. You can go ahead and um, attach this form to your IRB. And then this is kind of page two of our intake form. You can specify what kind of data you're looking for. So uh, depending on what box you select, it would go to the right person. For example, if you pick the you know, medical records, it would go to our queue, or if you pick um, something else like DICOM in images, it would go to the right person who can help you with that. Okay. And again, you will be sent an email after you submit the form with the case number and with some important links that you can, that are very helpful. Okay. So there are a lot more data sources than just Epic data. And we will again, help you connect with the right person. So for example, if you need radiology images, um, the RIT team can extract those images for you. Um, you can get waveform files, you can get vital signs, the Philips bedside monitoring data, and all different, there's a lot of cancer data. Uh, we have, there is a special um, a CRDB database with curated cancer data. So we will help you connect with the right people and we will help ensure that your compliance is um, complete. Okay. So uh, just one thing that we've noticed, people a lot of times, uh, they submit the request and they wait for the response. So the way our workflow works is you submit a request to get a case number and then you go in and you sign up for office hours. And this is how you're going to talk to us. Um, we do have an admin who normally follows up on submitted cases. If, there's, if, no, if the person doesn't sign up for, for an office hour, that is just easier. You submit uh, your request, you, you go and you sign up for office hour right away. We have office hours three times a week, so and, and there are normally spots available. So we'll be happy to talk to you. Okay. And then we'll talk about it uh, later, but we do charge for our services. So if we end up doing a data pool for you, we will um, request some salary support funding. Now, th there is no charge for office hours, of course. This is just a consultation. Okay, so this is kind of just examples. Um, for example, uh, in Star Tools, there is a limit to the size of the cohort you can create. I believe it's 7,500 patients. Um, we could create a larger cohort for you and pull the data, if, if that is your case. Um, we do a lot of, we work with uh, several labs that do machine learning. So we would extract millions of records for those labs. And that, that is, of course, a manual data pool. 
Great. And uh, yeah, these are just simple questions. How to find my health messages? We've done that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, what do I need to give you in order to get a work estimate? So we normally require a list of variables. We will discuss your project. We will ask you for a list of variables, and then we can give you a budget estimate for, for the work. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we would meet with you during the initial consultation. We would ask for a project overview. Uh, we would ask you for how to characterize your cohort, uh, what, what exactly, what variables exactly you're looking for, um, all necessary codes, maybe ICD codes or procedure codes uh, that you're looking for. Um, and uh, we would, based on that, we would give you a budget estimate. And uh, we would need a PTA. But normally your financial admin would have your department's financial admin would have uh, in order to start work okay. oops this is just kind of an example of uh, cohort identification for example you're looking for some index event the first mention of diagnosis or operation you can uh, you may specify the age range for you know the cohort of interest um, could be location uh, certain clinics or ER department um, and then we would ask you to specify inclusion uh, exclusion criteria anything temporal like MRI done within you know one week before the procedure for example something like that and then we can come up with the patient counts we normally normally a researcher knows approximately what to expect they know that the their criteria should return around 500 patients so if we get you know 30 we know that there's something wrong in the criteria and then we we'll work with a researcher to figure it out there are some variables very very easy uh, to find uh, they're normally available in um, star tools there are variables that mo like almost everyone asks for such as demographics, labs, diagnosis, encounters, and so on. And those are normally very easy for us to extract. Um, then there are some harder to do things. For example, if you're looking for some data uh, that is stored in unstructured, in, uh, unstructured data that is like stored in nodes, we can do some regular expression matching, but it normally requires some manual review. So you would still need to have someone manually review the notes and um, make sure that uh, what's extracted is what you're looking for there also so i've heard that clarity database has between 10,000 and 100,000 tables um, i don't know exactly how many but uh, there are some variables hidden deeply within that uh, data model and uh, sometimes you have some variables which are just will require several hours of research for us to to find. So that happens too. So we used to deliver data using Box. Um, right now, we mostly deliver data using Google Cloud Platform. Uh, we would create, uh, we, we would put the data files um, into a Google bucket and we would send you a link and instructions how to access it. It's pretty straightforward, um, fast, and easy to work with. Uh, what we can also do is if you do have your own gcp the google cloud platform project uh, we could and if we have like a large data set we could just share uh, the data set with you so you can copy tables over and you would have your tables right away in the big query um, sql uh, format what we also do is data de-identification so um normally uh, if you have large amount of data like you know lar a large amount of records uh, we pretty much 99.9 percent .9 of the time we de-identify them unless you need phi for some specific reason and it's approved you know by your irb and privacy offices we would de-identify the data and the way it works is we assign anonymous ids to all patients and then we assign a small number um, that is called jitter and uh, per patient so uh, for one patient all dates will be shifted let's say the jitter is four so all dates will be moved four days forward and then it, another patient would have a different jitter uh, and all dates would be moved the same amount 
So that's how the identification process works. We can also de-identify free text nodes. And just to know, they still stay high risk. Even after the identification, free text is still considered high risk because there is no 100% uh, guarantee that all PHI will be scrubbed. So again, I think Joe mentioned it already, but um, <clears throat> to set the expectations correctly, the EHR data is messy. There are pregnant men in the system. There are people like I pulled the weight one time for people and I ended up, and, and some weights just don't make any sense. So I ended up looking at the smallest possible weight. I Googled it was the lightest person in the world and they removed all data <laughs> less than that. And then the rest is up to researcher what kind of range they want to leave, leave in. So um, data is entered by you know thousands of people in various environments, and there are a lot of errors in it. So um, that's just those uh, that's the expectation. So the data is messy. Um, also, something we want to mention. So we sometimes do a project. We pull the we create queries. We pull the data. We deliver the data. And then a year later or six months later, a researcher comes back um, with additional questions or additional requirements. And just again to set expectations, we would probably need some time to start working. So between uh, the time we submitted the data, we delivered the data, and you know, six months from the date, we've probably done like dozens of other projects. We do not remember what we did for this particular one. This is one of the challenges of our work. So we have to read the notes again we have to open the code and see what was going on in that project so it will take us some additional time and uh, you know there are other projects that we are working on so um just please expect if you you know reach out a lot later please do expect some delay until we can start working on your project again Okay, and this is just like a quick sample project. Um, as an example, we also submit data to na uh, national registries. So this is a project I was working, I, I am still working on. Uh, we submit data to Kidney Research uh, Network. It's hosted by University of Michigan. And um, so we identified patients based on nephrology clinic visits, uh, not even on diagnosis. And all those patients that we, we received uh, data dictionary of about 100 variables, so possibly more um, of what uh, University of Michigan, what, what the registry is looking for. And we map this data to that data dictionary and we de-identify the data and we deliver it on a monthly basis. So we have quite a few national registries that we've done this for. So this is just another thing that we can help you with. And this is just one more time how to connect with us. Um, so you would submit a request, um, look for your email response with a case number, sign up for office hour. Uh, and then we would have a consult, we would ask you for a list of variables, um, we would provide a budget for you. Um, and, uh, you know, upon receiving the PTA, we would do a data pool. And then there are normally several iterations after we deliver the data research, it would come back with questions. Then there's like a data QA stage. Okay. And that is the end of my presentation. We'll be happy to answer any questions. I just wanted to jump in and, and uh, highlight something that you mentioned that I, you know, really cannot be overstressed about the data being messy. Um, I, I, I look at a lot of this data and, and there are, there are two kinds of data. There's data that is generated by, by uh, electronic systems and there's data that is entered by hand by busy clinicians and uh, even and non-clinical staff. And you will see things like, oh, someone has an appointment scheduled for 50 years into the future. Um, or uh, they're recorded as, as having, uh, you know, had uh, 
records that were transferred in that uh, are over a century old, but they're not actually a century old. Um, so it, it's just something that, that I think people really need to be aware of in terms of the, the, um, the quality of the data and, and how, it, how it affects your, your analysis of it. So thanks for mentioning that. Thank you, Joe. I agree completely. <laughs> well, there don't seem to be any other questions in the Q&A chat room. Um, so um, if people would like us to field uh, to, to answer more questions live um, during this time frame. We would love to hear from you. Just put them into the question and answer um, chat window. Otherwise, we may be wrapping up. All right, well, I think that that might be a wrap. Um, thank you everyone for attending today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy days to learn about Star Tools. So we're excited to be uh, your uh, partners in uh, excellent clinical research. And uh, we hope to see you at the next one of these excellent seminars on Star Tools. Uh, Priya, when is the next seminar? Uh, so the next one is um, next Wednesday at... Um, between three and five, April 26th, and that one's on ACE. Uh, we have another seminar coming up uh, on, um, you know, how to use BigQuery. Um, so BigQuery SQL, if you actually maybe use the STAR OMAP uh, data set, and that one is coming up on Thursday, May 4th, between one and three. Uh, we have the ATLAS and Network Studies Workshop on May 16th. And between the third and the fourth is actually the STAR Users Group meeting. And this year, we're actually having it over two days. So that's on May 10th and May 11th. May 10th between 9 and 12 in the morning, which is a Wednesday. And then Thursday between 1 and um, 4.30. So I think wherever you guys got this information, you should have, you know, all of this information was together for the users group meeting as well as um, um as well as for these workshops. Let me actually just see if I have a quick slide that I can show. I think I might. Just a second. And yeah, so let me just share my screen. Oops, sorry. Yeah, those are the workshops that are coming up. I'm happy to actually post this in the chat as well in case somebody hasn't gotten these. Um, but we'd love to see you at any of these. And then, um, you know, going back to one of the questions that people had asked, um, yes, this session has been recorded. Um, the Zoom, it will be posted, the recording will be posted on our STAR um, YouTube channel, the Stanford Star YouTube channel. I think I put that link um, in the chat as well. And uh, but we'll probably put them, you know, upload the the recordings once the entire series is done. So probably we're looking at end of May. Uh, but if there are no more questions, thank you everybody for joining. Actually, us. I had a question. Sorry, I have my hand raised. Sorry. Um, uh, no, 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 no worries. Um, and um, this question had to do with um, somebody who's interested in, say, RIC services. Um, we, when we are trying to schedule or work on data pools, there's also a regulatory and a privacy component. Um, and I wondered for researchers who perhaps want to do that, um, what is your recommendation or do you have any guidelines for what researchers should have done or gotten permission for before we even approach RIC, just so we can be sure we are not asking for sensitive data 
or you know is that information we would get from you is that something we need to have already flushed out on our end i would be great to get some pointers are you talking about compliance or you so you yes can... irb <laughs> privacy yes i mean you can talk to us we actually recommend that you talk to us uh, as early as possible <laughs> just to make sure you know we can answer your question we can see if, uh, tell you if the data is available um, you can also use star tools if you just do just use cohort discovery you do not need anything you just need sunet id so you can do the counts to kind of preliminary counts to make sure your project is feasible so you can talk to us as early as you have the project uh, you don't need to have an irb or privacy attestation approved and then we would Pretty much tell you where to go from there. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and it's worth noting that there's an enormous amount of information about compliance uh, paperwork and how to get it on the website med.stanford.edu slash star hyphen tools.html. There's uh, many, many pages about compliance, uh, very clearly illustrated walkthroughs about how to amend your IRB in order to use the star tools chart review tool. Um, so that that's all documented on the web. Great, thank you. I know for us, some of the stumbling blocks have often been what information is like feasible or not, just as Yelena was saying. And so it's and you know it's sometimes we're just chasing our own tails. So it's helpful to know that we can just confer with you before we embark on the next steps. Thank you for that. Right. Um, so I actually don't see anyone else's hands raised. I, so I, I don't see any more hands raised. So no. um, okay, everybody, thanks a lot for joining, and we will see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.